Good morning. Welcome to the show. Half an hour away from the open. Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. You're watching the China Show. I'm David Inglis with Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning: a busy day for eco data and policy in China, with the PBOC rate decision as well as key activity data due in the next two hours. Now, stocks across the region under pressure at the start of this trading week on concerns over a political crisis in France and signs central banks may delay easing policy. And I'm Paul Allen in Canberra, where Chinese Premier Li Qiang is meeting Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in a visit that caps a rapid revival in relations. Monday morning to you. We're not seeing it really happy if you're long these risk assets here this morning, and we're really starting things a bit on the back foot here. It seems like that French sort of political risk is really spreading, and you're seeing that fallout really not just in eurozone assets, but really globally speaking as well. Global stocks in general had one of the worst weeks in about two weeks or so. So certainly we are seeing equities slightly declining here in Asia. We're down about six tenths of one percent. Keep in mind though, some major markets in Southeast Asia and、uh, beyond are also shut for the holidays. So Singapore, Malaysia. Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the, all all goes to UAE. So certainly there are some major markets that are shut here this morning. But you take a look at how North Asia is doing and Australia. We're still basically、uh, seeing some broad declines. Look at the Nikkei 225. We're seeing two percent declines here right now. That's despite that weaker yen not really helping stocks here this morning. We're back to 157 levels、uh, after that BOJ meeting, which surprised, but then didn't quite surprise and didn't quite go there in terms of any details when it comes to QT as well. So JGBs yields are heading a bit. Lower here. Following what we saw in Treasuries, this rally seems to continue. Bond markets—they're really trading much more on the data these days, more so than what the Fed speaks. You certainly saw then the reactions after the inflation data, and as well as that Fed meeting where those dots were adjusted to just one cut this year. The markets are still pricing in maybe one and one and a half. Right now, when it comes to、uh, that pricing, so certainly we'll see if that further aligns this week as well. But we talk about really where the pain is going to be, and it's really going to be in Europe, right? You take a look at how old futures, how bond futures are doing here after we saw the spread of those bonds with the widest on record last week. Can we flip the boards and see how those are doing here? Obviously, stocks are going to be、uh, also vulnerable here as well、uh, around these snap elections and the like. So we're still seeing a bit of red here when it comes to、uh, bonds this morning. Euro dollar, we're at 107 levels. I think that's the weakest that we've seen in more than two months already for that currency. China has a big day, right? We talk about the data dump. We have MLF in just a few minutes. You have new, a new and old home prices coming through. So there's a lot to digest in the next hour or so, David. And certainly, we're watching how risk,、uh, you know, assets there. Are going to perform? You know, are we starting to see? If so, I think one in five economists think they might do something、mm. today. But then again, you know, at what point are we going to see the PBOC supporting growth over supporting the currency? That's still the debate among that. And around that, you take a look at how China futures are looking like. CGB bonds. You still continue to see that insatiable demand. That 50-year bond auction on Friday basically had the lowest yield on record. So certainly, we're watching the long end very closely here this morning. We're down some three basis points. Already 226 for your Chinese ten-year yield. Yeah, low growth, low rates, maybe even lower, as you point out. This hour, MLF, of course, coming up. Minority, although you do have about four or five economists among the pool, of course, that we've surveyed that do expect a reduction. There, more on that in a moment in a preview of that as well. So it's going to be busy, as Ivan is pointing out. Lots to digest as we approach the open and amidst this sort of wave of、uh, moderate risk aversion across these markets. A50 futures, four tens of one percent. We're getting some pressure across. The metal space of copper, aluminum, seeing some downside, nine tenths of one percent on the Shanghai contract on copper.、Uh, what's interesting, and we'll maybe look into this a bit further later on. You know, measures of implied vol on Hang Seng Index, for example, the HSI volatility index, lowest in 28 months. So we've taken out the the 20 level on Friday.、Uh, more on that in a moment. But yeah, certainly we'll get a really good snapshot of health of the Chinese economy following. The the credit numbers which came out 5 6 p.m. local time on Friday, which did indicate, of course, that we are、uh, demand is still wanting across many places here in the region. Right. So yeah,、um, let's get a preview. With UN loans, aggregate financing, all missed estimates. Yeah. M1. M1. You add that to weak inflation prints last week. I mean,、yeah. both those data prints are not really、uh, boding that much confidence in this recovery.、Yeah. Let's get to our China correspondent Min Min Lo on what to expect here today. 
Yeah, we're expecting the data to pull back a little bit in May, especially when it comes to industrial production that's likely to uh, come down to about 6% compared to, I think it was 6.7% uh, in April. Um, and that's just judging from the early gauges, the PMI print contracting in May and also the output sub-index decelerating in May, although still in the expansionary territory. Uh, fixed asset investment is likely to remain unchanged. We're expecting property investments to extend decline, but again, those government funding going into public investment is likely to counter that. Retail sales, that's going to be the bright spot in May. But again, economists are not expecting to interpret this as the start of a durable recovery because remember, we have the 618 shopping holiday, the right. second largest annual sale in China that's starting really as early as mid-May. So we saw home appliance sales surging nearly 150% in the second half of May. It's also boosted by the May Day holiday as well. So those are we're seeing some early strong numbers from the 618. Yeah. What about on, I think we have new home prices and used prices also, uh, used home prices coming out and also this uh, MLF, one-year lending facility. Yeah, so the MLF lending facility, we have about, I think, four economists out, out of 21 surveyed who uh, think that there'll be a rate cut of 10 basis points today. But still, the majority are expecting the PBOC to hold rates steady. And that's partly because, I mean, of course, with the ECB and Bank of Canada going ahead with rate cuts, it lowers the bar for the PBOC to act. But you're seeing, as you said earlier, Yvonne, that 50-year bond yields at historic lows. Yeah. And then we have the UN slipping 2% against the, the dollar since the start of this year. So there's a lot of cost as well for cutting rates. That's something for the PBOC to really balance here. And also the aggregate financing number coming out in May, we saw it went up over 8%, but outstanding loans still growing at the slowest pace so far. Um, and also the growth forecast now stands at 4.9%, which is pretty much in line with the government's target. And so many economists think that the PBOC is just not going to reflate the economy so urgently. They might wait for the Fed to go first. Okay, well, you got to wait maybe until next year. We'll see. Min Min Lo, uh, our China correspondent there with a preview of everything that is on deck today as we approach the opening bell about 23 minutes away. Stay tuned, by the way, for more analysis on the activity numbers coming through. So Helen Chow will be joining us top of the next hour with both a global research as we break those numbers. And you can also catch, by the way, and turn to your Bloomberg for our clients. TLIV Go commentary analysis as we start to hit our stride these next couple of minutes or so. Yep, we're kind of on the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. This is The China Show. Happy Monday. All right, here's your week ahead. Um, it is pretty busy when it comes to today in terms of data we talked about in China as well. There's some key rate decisions as well. I think RBA is probably going to be front and center uh, this week, just given it seems like there is this hesitancy that we've seen among central banks to really you know, lift off this easing cycle. We certainly heard that from the Fed last week as well. A BI also comes up with a decision, LPR, after, of course, an MLF, which is probably going to come out in about 10 minutes or so, BOE is expected possibly to maybe follow the ECB as mm. well. And, of course, we wrap up the week with some inflation numbers out of Japan. Yeah, although we do have elections coming through, of course, uh, in the U.K., so that might be an added complication there. Speaking of uh, elections, the reason perhaps we're seeing risk assets on offer today, and, you know, you mentioned this earlier on, this blowout in the, 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 the oat bun spreads yeah. last week, and the ECB had to come out and basically, well, they didn't come out. It's our reporting, to be more specific and clear. Uh, that as of now, no emergency measures are being planned, given the market turmoil in Europe last week, right? So when you look at stocks 50 futures, for example, 3 tenths of 1%. The CAC index was a down over 6% last week. Uh, you had a massive blowout, of course, in, in, in the spread. The euro was down against virtually every single one of its peers last week. Uh, we could actually take out, we don't have the chart, we'll show you later, this trend line. Uh, if you draw a line from late last year into where we are currently right now. So in, in other words, what I'm trying to say, Europe is, is front and center given the risk event out there. Let's bring in Ben Lup, senior multi-asset strategist at State Street Global Markets. Good morning and nice to see you. Good morning to both. Do I need to worry about Europe? 
Well, I think in the near term, yes. I think obviously the knee-jerk reaction means that global volatility is going to be much higher across mm. risky assets. Again, I think what we're more concerned is still the macro fundamental story. And to us in Asia, the more predominant issue remains to be when is, is going to be the Fed's pivot. I think that still remains to be the biggest um, issue when it comes to whether or not the dollar strength is going to cool off and whether or not we'll see actually more flows to come in back to the region. Near term wise, I think for Europe, obviously, it, it's still going to be uh, an issue when it comes to the overall um, uh, elections, not just obviously in Europe, but also in the UK. Um, when it comes to the flows that we look at on the custody side, uh, everything seems to be still normal. Um, okay. I mean, positioning is not super, super heavy either on, on both sides. So we are still seeing neutral positions. So I think it's still wait and see mode in terms of getting more clarity onto it. But in terms of whether or not this is going to spill over to global growth or, or actually impact on Asia, mm -hmm. I still think it's still quite limited for now. You're, you're saying most of the risk taking we've seen is across D. Correct. Of course, and given the volatility we've seen yeah. across some, you know, can you still have a pretty big exposure to, to DM right now? I mean, it seems like you're focusing a lot on the U.S. still. Yeah, so the biggest exposure for us remains to be in U.S. Um, that's where the growth is to us uh, in terms of where we actually like um, the overall macro story. Uh, earnings are still much, much stronger in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. So we're still happy to keep those exposures for now. Obviously, as I mentioned, volatility is going to creep up a little higher given how low it has stayed for basically throughout this year. Uh, but yeah, U.S. remains to be that biggest story that we still like. Is it is vol too low? I mean, the VIX has been at 12. Is it? I mean, markets have done well, so it's yeah. expected to be low. But I'm wondering whether or not you see anything on the horizon that might sort of disturb the peace. Yeah, I think um, the biggest, I, I think the reason why we still continue to see volatility being so low is that we are still expecting the Fed to cut rates, and, and that still remains to be the base case for everyone, mm -hmm. given that inflation continues to move towards this disinflationary trend. Mm -hmm. I think the, the last month data was really the, the big bang data that everybody was hoping for, where it was basically below 0.2% month over yeah. month, right? So that basically means that by the end of the year, if we can actually keep that momentum, we can actually get core PCE back to below 3%. And that's really the key uh, message that the Fed has always been reiterating, where it's coming down, but it's not coming down fast enough. And that last month data could be that inflection point for us to actually see it moving into that, that right direction, at least in, in, in the near term. So I think overall, uh, it's still a good environment for risk, but you are going to see volatility pick up a bit because of those tensions that and we're tech seeing. tech in the U.S. is still your biggest overweight. Is it getting too crowded, you think, this space? It is crowded. I have to be honest with you, Yvonne. I think that, that is one of the most crowded positions that we track uh, with respect to institutional investors' ownership. Uh, but we where earnings are, that still remains to be much more superior. And when we actually look at the current cycle of tech where they have the less or the least debt to, towards the beta, uh, that's still something that's very different when you actually look at previous cycles where these tech companies are much less cash heavy comparing to before. So they're really less sensitive to any movements in, in the rate story as well. So, so that's why we still like this story, even though, to your point, Yvonne, it's, it's, over, it's overpriced and obviously it's still a, a massive overweight that we see from institutions. Yeah, investors. it's hard to fight the tide, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Correct. Despite conventional wisdom telling you, Otherwise, where does it leave yeah. the rest of the, the equity, global equity complex? Yeah, so for us, I think the biggest shift really going into the second half for us on the team is really to, we've actually moved more towards um, reducing our convection in EM. Um, be it both in emerging market equities and also in the uh, local currency space for the bond space. Okay. Uh, I think the last time I came here, we were actually quite positive on the local currency right. sovereign bond story, right, where we anticipate that EM central banks are going to cut first. Inflation is going to be much more cooler comparing to what we see from the developed markets. When we actually look at now the inflation story that we track, EM prices are now creeping a little higher again. Um, EM central banks are a lot more hesitant now to cut rates given the higher for longer narrative that we're seeing as well in the U.S. So I think the spreads are unlikely going to narrow much really in, in the current environment, which is why we have toned down our positive convictions. Mm -hmm. EM equities, again, I think the sentiment has improved now that I think China is more supportive of the uh, solving the property crisis. You are seeing that flows are slowly moving back in. But but macro fundamentals are still quite weak, and that really is reflected in the earnings revision story. So earnings are still quite negative, which is why we also take the, take the, um, take the call to actually move it back to neutral for now for also EM equities. Yeah. But even in Asia, you're not looking too positive. I mean, despite what we've been seeing in rallies in, in Korea, 
in, in Taiwan on this whole AI trade. Yeah, too. I think the selected markets, to your point, Yvonne, like yeah. AI or tech, obviously, they, they ride more on the U.S. tech story, which is why they have done well. But flows haven't actually been that strong either. I mean, it's very much concentrated in selected names. If we are more, if we need to be more positive, I think we need to expect a more broader rally and a more broader earnings upgrade. And unfortunately, that's yeah. not something that we see yet. No. In the bond space, just to pick up on something you yeah. said, what, what do you think of high yield? Because most people that we've had on recently still like high yield. It's doing well. Spread, yes, yeah, spreads yeah. to compress yeah. even further. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't fight the tide as what we, what we think. We right. still like the credit story in the U.S., I think. In the U.S., okay. In the U.S., yeah, more on the U.S. Um, in terms of EM, I guess we're still more cautious to, towards that end because we just think that with the, with the, with the fact that the Fed is unlikely going to cut anytime soon. We still think the only one cut that will come in will be very late in the year. So there's still going to be a lot more events that could trigger that volatility story running from now to the end of the year that this isn't really the right moment to actually move back into an overweight in, in EM bonds yet. So we, we would still be more cautious for now. Yeah. But if the Fed's only penciling maybe one rate cut this year, I mean, you know, can spreads, can, can they stay pretty tight still? I think, I think we can just get the coupon from it okay. in terms of it. Spreads-wise, I think it's more going to be driven by the Fed, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What's the dominant risk now? What's, what causes the pain trade moving well, forward? Well, I think the biggest would still be U.S. policies being, being the biggest uncertainty. Monetary policy? Yeah, mo monetary policy still being the biggest uncertainty. And then the second thing would still be the China growth story. I still think that right now the PBOC, or at least from China, from, from our view, is that the priority is still focusing on stabilizing the currency. And that has its consequences because when we actually see that there's less liquidity, stronger fixings, overvalued currencies versus the CFX baskets, all of those simply means that they prefer to have a stable currency, but that means it's at the expense of growth, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and fiscal policy can come through, but it's often the biggest lag when it comes to driving longer term growth. So if there's no monetary support to it, then unfortunately, that's still going to be a story that's going to drag does on. That, yeah. Does that tell you in somehow that some way China's reached the limit of monetary policy? Towards a, to a certain extent, yeah, there's definitely limitations now in terms of how much they can do. I mean, I mean, we have some economists expecting maybe a cut for MLF or even the LPR, but what levels, right, can you actually go down to? We're already at closer to record lows already in terms of those rates. Mm. So whether or not you can actually go uh, 10 basis points, maybe, but can you actually go 100 basis points lower and, and to have that same effect? Unfortunately, that's, that's going to be very difficult. So it really relies on the fiscal side to push more, but we still see quite a bit of a disappointment for now in terms of what they can do. I mean, CGVs has been, basically you're seeing that, right, yeah. being reflected. Is that something that that trade can, can last for some time then, you think, this well, rally? It is, it is extended, I have to say. Yeah. I mean, when we actually look at how CGB yields have moved relative to how LPR rates have actually moved, it's, it, there is now this uh, very big divergence already in terms of where rates are. So it is a, a trade that we think is, is, has run its course already, I think, at least in the near term. So we are more cautious in terms of looking at the in general broader EM space for now. Yeah. Okay. All right, Ben, thank you thank for you. kicking off the week Fantastic. with us. Ben, look, senior multi-asset strategist at State Street Global Markets. I think we're just seconds away from that MLF. Uh, keep in mind, those rates are about 2.5%. There, there you go. Uh, so we are seeing it unchanged yeah. and keeping that one year at 2.5%, also conducting about 182 billion RMB uh, in that operation here today. So uh, it is as expected. I think most did expect that they were going to keep those rates on hold. There was, a, I guess, a, a small group that thought, including our own very own Bloomberg Economics, like given the weak data that we've got last week, that the case for a cut was there, but maybe not, not this month. Maybe not. It's, it's a good point that our guest just now, of course, Ben, ben Luft just pointed out, right? So if you, can, you could move by 10, but effectively you want to move by 100 to make a difference. But can you move by When the currency is so weak. When the currency is so weak. Okay, uh, the difference, though, when you look at the markets right now is unchanged on rate, although the amount that they've effectively taken out of the system right now it's $55 billion because of them conducting 182 uh, in one year MLF. We were expecting, and then you add, you add the 55 on top of the 182, which was the amount maturing today, effectively. But yeah, no change. Interest rates. Next one coming up will be in about nine minutes or so. New home prices for the month of May. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Right, happy Monday and welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're just over, well, just under six minutes to the opening bell and futures are pointing lower. More on this sort of moderate move to take remove, uh, remove risk off the table for now. And this is something, by the way, we've seen also in U.S. markets, right? So we're looking at a Hang Seng Vol Index. Uh, so on Friday, interestingly enough, we took out 20, uh, which takes us back to about the lowest level in about 28 months or so, which is interesting enough is as well, when you take the average pre-pandemic before, of course, things uh, literally blew out when the pandemic hit. We're actually back at that specific level on a nominal basis. Now, whether or not the average is there, not quite. You have to take the average from that point to here, which is still slightly above that yellow line. But in any case, of course, encouraging numbers, given how things how quiet things have become, although we have been trading, if one in the range here on the Hang Seng Index, uh, following the 20, 30 percent rally. And then the last few weeks have certainly uh, seen a, a pullback in risk appetite, particularly onshore, where I think we're down four straight weeks now uh, on the CSI 300 going into this Monday open. Yeah, there really just haven't been catalysts, really, yeah. in the stock market. Um, but certainly when you take a look at what's set up here today, it looks like we're basically on course to, to really join what we're seeing across the region here, which is basically some declines when it comes to equities. The Hang Seng pre-market just opening up. We are down about half of 1%. Eight shares also by similar measure. Tech is on offer here today, and we're still dealing with a pretty weak currency at 720 seven levels. I, think, I believe the dollar was up for a fourth straight week uh, that we've already seen. So that resurging dollar certainly is still weighing across EMFX here today. In terms of analyst actions, there's one on, le uh, on the EV space that we've got to tell you about. Uh, certainly when it comes to what we've been seeing with these tariffs and the like, I mean, Lee Auto, eight shares rated new neutral at J.P. Morgan. Chow Tai Fook, uh, that was cut to a hold at BOC. Uh, you know, we saw a close to 9% drop yesterday or on Friday uh, after those earnings didn't miss estimates. So certainly uh, they're flagging, uh, at least when it comes to BOC, uh, just the weakness there. Also, City opening a downside 30-day catalyst watch on that stock as well. And Jiangxi Copper, those A shares rated new outperform at CCB. In terms of stocks to focus today, we're watching the tech space. We talk about June 18th. Yeah, well, Minman mentioned it, right? Those deals and all that were already happening way before that. That's why maybe what we did see uh, retail sales might actually outperform a little bit here today when that activity data comes out, but not seeing a huge reaction among the consumption space here today. Yeah, we're looking at paying on insurance plus other things happening as well, not on your boards currently. We're also looking at Huizhou Mao Tai, which is just really Oof. being tossed out the window. More on that in a moment and the open. This is The China Show. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're counting down the open of markets. We're also just seconds away from new and old home prices out of China coming through here as well. So certainly one to watch if you're looking at these property stocks and the like here today. And given what we saw, a little bit, maybe some disappointment uh, from the market when it comes to this MLF remaining unchanged. Maybe we were hoping maybe the PBOC was leaning more towards cuts, especially after what the ECB did just a few weeks ago, but nah, not today. No, it doesn't seem like the case. Plus, they've removed money out of the system, or at yeah. least refrained from injecting money again for a fourth straight month. Uh, and this comes on the back of credit numbers, which showed money supply and most metrics continue to effectively signal that demand for credits is, is more than wanting. In fact, when you look at this ratio between government borrowing and credit creation, that's actually on the way up. So when you have real lending in the economy starting to really move down. Okay, as far as markets go, this is quite a pronounced move in the early going. Six tenths of one percent. Uh, Mao Tai, which is bottom row on your left, is down successive days. The stock is down 13 percent now wow. uh, from the top. Uh, and it's looking like we're effectively oversold when you look at some of the metrics, but it's continuing uh, to get sold off as well. Uh, the open in Hong Kong, please put the boards if we can, and that should reflect the overall risk aversion we're seeing in the region. So we're down a further 1% on the main benchmarks. And as you can see, all the big stocks, bottom of your screens, are also seeing some downside right now. Focus short term, near term support levels, 50 day moving average on both the Hang Seng Index and the Hang Seng uh, Tech Index as well. I'm just checking my Bloomberg terminal right now. If we are, we should be getting at some point, yeah, not already. Yeah, do we have it out? So new home prices okay. falling 0.71% oh, month oh. on month. So that oh. is quite a, a drop actually from the previous month that we've seen. And I believe 
That's the biggest drop we've seen in 10 years or so, Dave. Yes. So at 0.7% month and month, that is the that is the steepest month and month drop in new home prices across 70 cities, going all the way back to 20, 2014. You have to go all the way back to October of 2014. At that month, we fell eight tenths of one percent from the September of that month of that year. So this is quite a stark drop uh, in new home prices coming through. May existing home prices are down one percent month and month. So in terms of price, it there doesn't seem to be any indication, at least on the surface level, uh, that some of the measures that major cities in, you know, in April and May, they've really moved, moved to remove all the cooling restrictions have started to work. So on price, there we go. It's now actually uh, this redhead on your Bloomberg terminal. May new home prices dropping faster than April and also new home prices dropping faster than April. Yeah, so it's not good. And you would think, I think the economists that we talked to said, you know, maybe by the second half, you're, you're going to maybe start to see some of these, you know, flurry of housing policies mm. might start changing the data a bit. But we're, we're not quite there yet. And this doesn't really bring much confidence here, especially given just the whacking in these consumption stocks yeah. of late. You talk about Kuei Chao Mao Tai, which used to be such a darling among investors. Right. That's down some double digits already. And it really just goes to show the consumption downgrade story is quite real. We're still in the thick of it here right now. And the property story very much, much is, I guess, the, you can blame it on that. Yeah, the most part, yeah. Ch chicken and the egg, right? And I think you were flagging this earlier on during the break that there was this analyst call coming out talking about the pr producer prices on Malta, right? So wholesale prices is really where the company can, uh, you know, can effectively control its, its destiny. It's in the retail market where... Uh, they have less control over the price of their boost. But, you know, that said, if, if a company like Mao Tsai that is, is perceived to be one that can protect its margin, has very fat margins, if that's coming under pressure, the narrative is starting to change as well. Okay, uh, that's the China market story for now. Uh, this takes us into the broader credit story and maybe just to pivot to maybe slightly more good news as well. So this unprecedented bond issuance uh, that we've seen here, borrowing costs have been tumbling uh, to record lows. Uh, across this almost CGB market. In fact, the 10 years now also started to pivot even lower, the rally in fixed income there. Let's talk about this big picture. Our Asia credit editor, Finbar Flynn, is with us right now to talk us through this. Finbar, th there's a broader story to be, to be told, I guess, when you look at Asian high yield, but let's start in China here. So what is happening exactly in these local markets? Why are foreign firms starting to sell renminbi uh, and starting to tap uh, this specific local credit market? Hey, hey, good morning, David. So uh, you just mentioned that uh, the rates that you can get now in China are a lot cheaper than you can even get in the United States. That's a, a major flip from only a few years ago. So 2.5% uh, the policymakers left unchanged this morning, but uh, we're still, uh, you know, 5%, 5.5% in the United States on the benchmark. So what is basically happening is something we've seen in markets in elsewhere for a long time, it's a, a reach for yield. So that extra spread that people can get on um, overseas products, basically, you know, we, we're seeing in the market, uh, uh, German issuers especially, BMW issuing in yuan, uh, buyer. So it's that extra reach for yield, essentially, and that's drawing in overseas players, and it's also stimulating issuance uh, locally. Yeah, and I guess it's fueling this overall junk bond rally in in. Asia, basically. I mean, why do you think it is doing so well? Is it really just fueled by China? I mean, we are seeing returns now approaching about 10 percent year to date. So the, these two dynamics are, are really interesting and they are closely related because uh, the actual gains you're getting close to 10 percent in Asia on junk bonds is because as you, we all well know, there was a meltdown in the Chinese housing sector and all those bonds have basically defaulted. and. Um, They've gone out of the indexes, so now investors are a lot more comfortable climbing back into Asian junk bonds because they're basically bank credits. They're also better consumer uh, credits. They're elsewhere in the region as well. So you've got a better backdrop here in Asia than you have in many parts of the world. You've got a lot of that bad news out of the system. So the returns you're getting for Asian junk now are, are exceptional. Yeah, and, and the tights, to your, to your point, are increasingly mechanically getting extremely tight, you know, and what, what, what's your view? Like, what are people telling you guys, Finbar, on whether or not, you know, markets think, can, you know, think this can continue? 
So in terms of the, the, the junk uh, bond spreads and the yields, it's part of a global story where you know, this was meant to be the year of the bond essentially, but it hasn't yet taken hold you know, year to date at least. So people are piling into junk, not just in Asia, but elsewhere. But with, with Asia, you know, it's more of a new dynamic that wasn't there in the last couple of years. So people are sticking with junk for now. Um, they see the, you know, the spreads, the economies are holding up and they're actually hoping to you know, stick with junk for the rest of the year until yields come down in the dollar space by the Fed. All right, Finbar, thank you. Finbar Flynn there on the latest on these junk bonds in Asia. I just want to recap some of this data that we got when it comes to these new home prices and old home prices in China, both of which did disappoint and both saw actually steeper drops uh, than the previous month as well, especially when it comes to the existing homes where 1% drop month to month. We, we rarely see that. I think it was a record yeah. drop that we've seen. I mean, you, you don't normally even see that on a year and year number, let yeah. alone month to month, right? So it, it, this might further underscore the aversion from home buyers to get in when prices are falling this quickly. Uh, on new homes as well, less so, not 1%, but this is down 0.7%, yeah. which on a chart, this looks like this, right? The worst, biggest drop going back also about 10 years. So uh, I'm really curious to, to, uh, to hear Helen Chow's uh, take on this. Of course, both of us securities joins us in about 20 minutes from now to help us understand what's going on here or what isn't going on, plus, of course, the data that I'm coming through out of mainland China later today. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, Chinese Premier Li Qiang is meeting with Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in Canberra today as the world's second largest economy seeks warmer ties. Our very own Paul Allen joins us live from the Australian capital. And Paul, maybe just lay out what was on today's agenda. Well, uh, in a few moments, we should see uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and uh, Chinese Premier Li Chiang uh, signing a joint declaration. Then there'll be some uh, comments uh, from both sides. And the tone of those comments is expected to be somewhat conciliatory. We've had a bit of a preview of those from earlier in this trip by Premier Li. He was saying that uh, the relations between Australia and China are back on track. He's described Australia as being as in a unique position to act as a bridge between the East and West. Uh, for Anthony Albanese's part, uh, he said that, look, these issues the two countries have had uh, cannot be allowed to fester in silence, and uh, consistent, steady engagement is the way to have the chart the path forward from here. Now, from here, uh, there will be a lunch. The Chinese Premier will then meet the Governor-General and also the leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, uh, who had some good news today. According to the latest opinion poll, uh, he now leads Anthony Albanese as preferred Prime Minister. And uh, that's kind of interesting because relations between Australia and China did sink to a low uh, the last time the coalition was in power. So it might be a good opportunity for Li Chang to uh, meet uh, somebody who could have the potential to be Australia's next prime minister. So, uh, Paul, that's, that's potential progress. What about points of friction? Still plenty of those. Uh, in fact, while we've had most of the trade strikes against Australia by China wound back, there's still a couple remaining. There's uh, two beef abattoirs uh, that uh, are still unable to send their produce to China, live lobster exports as well. It would seem logical, it would feel logical that both of those either get wound back during this trip or soon afterwards because everything else is gone. Uh, the strikes against barley, against wine, against coal, lumber, they're all wiped out. It would be a little bit odd to leave those others in place. But points of friction that do remain, uh, Anthony Albanese has said uh, he intends to raise with Li Chiang uh, these clashes and near misses between the two militaries. Uh, China, of course, uh, well, Australia accused China just last month of uh, a Chinese jet uh, firing flares in the path of an Australian helicopter. Uh, there is also the case of Yang Hin Jung, a dual Chinese Australian national, a writer who was still detained in China uh, facing a suspended death sentence. Uh, China would also like to invest more in Australia's critical mineral space, uh, but just recently we've had Australia ordering uh, Chinese investors in northern minerals, a small critical minerals miner, to divest. So that's still a very sensitive area as well. I guess what's making it a little bit better is that we're seeing a bit of panda diplomacy uh, back in Australia as well. Can you update us on, on how we yeah. are in terms of the panda situation? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. So, well, that, that's how Premier Lee began his trip, of course, was by a visit to Adelaide, uh, which is where Australia's only two pandas are. Now, after 15 years, uh, Wang Wang and uh, Fu Ni, they're heading back to China, uh, having failed to produce any offspring, I might add, but they'll be replaced with a new pair of pandas. Now, it might seem cute, fuzzy, trivial, but panda diplomacy is, of course, extremely symbolic, uh, extremely important, and it does demonstrate how things have warmed up between the two nations. Uh, it was only 2021 that China was issuing its list of 14 demands or 14 grievances, and it was only uh, earlier this year that those trade strikes against wine were wound back. So uh, the the warming of relations has been rapid, it's been impressive, and that uh, panda diplomacy that you mentioned, very, very symbolic of that. Paul Allen there. Um, just getting us up to speed on this trip, of course, of the Chinese Premier. Let's bring in Marina Yuezhang, Associate Professor in the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, Marina, good morning and thanks for joining us. Um, as, as our correspondent just now outlined, it's been, it's been rapid, it's been fast, the warming of relations, and then there are pandas too on top of all of that. Very encouraging. Indeed. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, okay, your thoughts. The, uh, Can you continue? Hmm. Oh, yes. The panda diplomacy actually uh, carries more significant um, gestures in the geopolitics. This is part of China's, um, um, not soft power, but uh, re-establish uh, narratives that China is um, moving towards um, more opening and good relations uh, with its neighbors, especially in the uh, Asia-Pacific Australian obviously um, is, a, is um, a very important player in this area um, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, um, Australian as one of the um, one, one of the closest allies to the United States, uh, China's visit um, after seven years from the um, premier sends a very strong signal that China is still having friends in the Western um, Western uh, alliances. Uh, this is extremely important because uh, uh, China doesn't want to have a um, very unified uh, frontier uh, from the West. So can, can we expect this sort of stabilization of relations to continue is one thing, because it seems like, as Paul mentioned, that there is still some structural issues here, whether it's, you know, China wanting to access critical minerals in Australia, which it seems like Canberra is trying to restrict. Also, the security ties that you mentioned as well. I mean, do those, you know, sort of frictions still remain? Uh, indeed, um, they are. Um, good thing is both parties, both um, the Chinese premium and uh, Australian's prime minister expressed their um, Kind of villainous to 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 manage the disagree, disagreement disagreements. Um, I mean, Chinese saying is um, well, gentlemen, um, gentlemen pursue hum, uh, harmony rather than uh, uniformity in their relationships. And um, this is, uh, I guess, a philosophy for both parties to work together. Um, in terms of critical minerals, this is a very sensitive area, obviously. Australian, uh, from uh, from an uh, economic perspective, uh, can benefit a lot from uh, working with China, not just investment, but technology. Uh, the reason is China, without Australian, China will have its sources for uh, critical minerals. But with China, Australian can get a right uh, when China delivers um, processing um, uh, processing critical minerals to a lot of countries, including Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, but uh, but uh, Australian is in the, in the very difficult position because Australian is also uh, one of the main suppliers in the uh, mineral security uh, partnership uh, led by the U.S. Marina, I'm curious, how, how is the trip being talked about and received domestically there where you are? Um, divided. Um, actually, I'm just um, um, in, uh, in the Parliament House and I can see two parties, um, protesting teams and welcome teams, uh, they're sort of competing um, to get their, noise, get their voices heard by more people, maybe um, not just in Canberra, but in Australia and even maybe uh, globally. Uh, so this is um, the dilemma China uh, is facing.
the reason is because China is facing a lot of uh, domestic issues. Um, those, a lot of those economic issues actually are uh, can be attributed to um, a deteriorating geopolitical environment China is facing right now. So such a visit by um, by Pre uh, Premier Li Qiang is very important for China. Um, can you tell us a bit more? I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering. This is a, this trip is coming on the backdrop of of the EU just slapping tariffs yeah. and increasing tariffs on EVs in China, mm -hmm. and yet you're, you're seeing a stark contrast in some ways to what we're seeing in this relationship between Canberra and, and Beijing. When it comes to critical minerals, are we likely to see Australia adopt maybe a harder line mm -hmm. towards Chinese investment into this space? Uh Politically, both parties uh, in Australia and in Canberra, they probably will, um, because this is um, um, in the terms of uh, uh, protecting national interests. Um, but national interests can cover many things. Security is one of them. Economic prosperity is another. Uh, without China's supply chains, um, Australia will find it will supply its very um, very um, treasured critical minerals to very small um, small um, buyers. So that's 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 the thing. Um, mm. But I don't mm. think Australian government will back off from its very hard stance against China uh, in terms of critical minerals. Now, Australian China forward. relationship. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead, please, please. I'm just trying to say Australian-China relations um, is, not, is never a two-party game. It always involves a third party, okay. that is the United States. Okay, I'm, I'm just curious right now what, you know, what, what gains we can lock in from this current trip in terms of the short term, the next few months. Do, you, do we expect more people-to-people -people exchanges, you know, business delegations, foreign students and flows of foreign students both ways, Marina? Um... Again, that's domestic politics. Um, the government, both parties, have uh, have had this very hard stance of, uh, on China uh, in terms of, for example, uh, limitations of talent, mobility, students, exchanges, and all those things. Uh, the reason is, well, uh, the Australian uh, federal election is, is next year, so um, this is a safe card for them to play. Um, but that's not going to solve the problems for Australian uh, in terms of its, uh, its um, escalating um, housing prices, rental um, prices, and so on. Mm. And, uh, and that will also cast a lot of um, doubts on Australian's higher education in terms of their revenues. Um, uh, so so it's, it's, it's kind of a mix of a geopolitical and a political issues together. All right, Marina, thank you so much. Marina Yue Zhang there, Associate Professor of Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. We have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. Just to recap, the breaking numbers coming, which came through about... I'm going to be clocked on 23 minutes back here at about the open. New home prices, existing home prices in China. We're now looking at 12 straight months of declines. Month on month, 70 cities. That's 12 months from here. You have, of course, this brief pickup. But, of course, if you take that all the way back to 2021, effectively you're seeing this trend really of falling prices in China as well. That's number one. Number two is on an... Uh, the sort of aggregate basis and a magnitude basis, that's actually the biggest drop going back uh, about 10 years or so. That's in price. In terms of market breadth, if there is a measure of market breadth here uh, to, uh, to mention as well, we have another chart which shows you this. So 70 cities, what of the 70 cities are seeing declines? What portion of those 70 cities are seeing a pickup? And where are things remaining effectively unchanged? Can we change the chart, please? Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a breakdown of that. And in fact, 67 or 68 cities, which effectively leaves only three cities off that sample size seeing now seeing price gains so again effectively almost all cities in that sample size are now showing declines in new home prices and you have to go all the way back about nine years or so back to 2015 um, to sort of get 
the, the, the sort of breadth that we're seeing as far as this is concerned right now. So it's, 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 it's widespread, uh, declines are quite stark. It's also important to keep in mind, Yvonne, of course, back, it was only back April and May when most of these cities actually started to unleash and remove some of those True. restrictions to buy, right? So we'll maybe need to wait more time wait, uh, until maybe those things come to effect. Yeah, I mean, these things take time, right? Yeah. There's, there's a lag effect and maybe, mm -hmm. but still, um, doesn't bode well that actually you're seeing these price declines actually mm -hmm. ramp up or at least accelerate in some ways as well. And we'll see how this all plays out. Activity data, of course, coming through property yeah. stocks are falling on the back of that data as well. You're watching The China Show. Welcome back to the China Show. Here's a look at the CSI 300 just a half hour into the session. It looks like we're still seeing some declines. But, you know, overall, we've seen a series of disappointments from the one year MLF was remained unchanged as expected. But still, I think there was still a small group that was expecting that maybe we could finally see some policy stimulus from the monetary side of things. That didn't happen. And then there's new home price data and old home price data, both of which saw bigger drops than the previous month as well. So it just goes to show, you know, what does this mean for the activity data that we're about to see in just a few seconds now? Yeah, uh, there's also a seasonal factor involved here, right? Because you had a holiday in early May, and then, of course, the latter part of, of May is when you did get the initial sort of programs and discounts going into 618, the, the, the shopping yeah. holiday, right? So there might be that aberration there. The numbers are out. Here we go. So why don't we start off with, you take your pick. What do you want to start right. off with? Uh, industrial production, this is uh, a miss year of 5.6% here. Uh, these are, of course, the year-on-year -year numbers, and we are seeing a slowdown of that in terms of industrial output. Retail sales, though, that one seems to uh, outperform. There you go, 3.7%, which is better than expected as well. We talked about 618. You talk about the amount of people traveling mm. uh, in the month of May as well during the holidays. What else are you seeing, Dave? So property investments, uh, going into the story we were talking about just about 10 minutes ago on new home sales, negative 10.1%. This is year to date. This is uh, cumulative, I believe. Yep, uh, all the way through. And fixed asset investment year to date, four percent, also coming in slightly uh, below estimates. So apart from retail sales, everything seems to be on weaker footing, and perhaps underscores the weakness in this economy. Still, yeah, 5.6 percent industrial production. 6.2 was the estimate. Let's get instant reaction. Joining us here in set, Helen Chow. Chief Greater China Economist at BOFA Global Research. Uh, just your uh, initial suspicions on the data. I would say that the retail sales was uh, definitely a positive surprise, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that because of the May 1st the holidays and then uh, also the uh, on the back of that, we have seen some you know uh, a high frequency service consumption data uh, coming in re relatively strong, and therefore I think that was uh, in a way kind of expected. Yeah. But uh, I think it was indeed a bummer to look at the investment, and uh, especially in year to date terms, it slowed down from 4.2 percent to 4.0, implying that on a single month basis, this must have uh, slowed down more significantly uh, from the, uh, the April level. So this is uh, raising a question because we originally thought that second quarter would be the time when yeah. investment should be strongest, uh, giving the funding support and uh, all the emphasis on three projects, etc. However, first quarter came in as being extremely strong, 4.5 back then. And at that time, we thought then probably second quarter could be you know, some sequential slowdown, but in year-on-year -year terms, still hold Holding up reasonably well against a very low base, but so far the data is telling us that wasn't the case. So now it brings back uh, the question that what exactly was driving the the, the growth uh, investment growth back in first quarter that actually seems to have lost some momentum in the second quarter. Uh, you know, back in the first quarter we were surprised to see that utility sector, especially probably related to electricity grid expansion, was the re real reason behind the, uh, the 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 surprise on the upside. But th this time, I think we need to look at the details to know that whether that sector has slowed down somewhat. Mm. Is there now more urgency to, for policymakers to reflect this economy? If you take a look at the data that we've seen, pair it with the, the credit data, the inflation that still remains quite slow here, or can we continue on this kind of two-speed growth model for some time? As long as they keep that growth target in place this year, are we likely to see any more stimulus? 
You're right, Yvonne. I'm afraid that the data from last week exactly told us that, uh, you know, aggregate demand-wise, it is still relatively weak. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, CPI inflation staying at 0.3 percent is nothing to be proud of. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the leading indicators such as money and credit, they're telling us that uh, credit demand is still relatively weak. Uh, the PBOC is saying that uh, don't look at the, uh, the, the money and credit data as closely as you did in the past anymore because the relationship between the money and credit and the fundamentals have already changed but we don't know how much has has it changed and so far what is reflected is still a relatively weak picture on the credit demand side so we think that this is saying at a time when property sector remains still very much lackluster we haven't seen enough new force you know productivity new force growth coming in in, in time and in place to basically substitute the growth drivers we used to see in the past from the you know upstream or downstream the whole value value chain of a property sector. So we still need to see new stimulus coming in. Otherwise, the growth momentum could very much weaken. What else needs to come in? Well, uh, we are seeing some demand side stimulus, which has been, you know, quite helpful. For example, we're talking about the equipment replacement program right. um, that the mm -hmm. central and local governments are combining and subsidizing. And we're also talking about the consumer products trading programs and cash for clunker stuff. Mm -hmm. So these, I think, on the, on the demand side are very much helpful. But would that be alone, you know, uh, pushing up the, the growth back to where it's supposed to be and closing up the alpha gap? I think the jury is still out. Yeah. Can you tell us, I mean, the, the, the home price data that we got was quite disappointing uh, overall. I mean, this is, of course, I think just a few weeks or even a few months after they announced this big rescue package. Is, is it just a matter of time that we have to wait for the data to turn a little bit more positive? Or do you think this, this, this package just came a little bit too late for us to see actually a turnaround in the housing sector. Overall speaking, I think the property policy adjustment came in a little bit too little too late. However, I would say that I was holding my expectation higher now after seeing the four arrows from the central government about a month ago. Uh, so it, including the, the unprecedented move to lower the requirement for down payment uh, to 15% and 24% for the first and second purchase of properties. So those kind of measures are for the first time since 1998, the reform of, uh, of the housing sector you know, coming in, you can see that the government is trying its best to try to push for uh, for the housing demand. However, I think that might still be relatively early for us to look at the new property prices, which is, by the way, what is reported in the media most of the time uh, for for price increases. Yeah. Because I think the first sign of improvement, in, you know, if I were to look for anything, I would say will probably come from the secondary market. Mm -hmm. The secondary market is where the volume has been much higher, and also. So if we are seeing the demand coming back in, you know, very strongly, that will probably first go into the secondary market as well. And when that happens, you will see that the prices will stabilize and in certain places start to tick up a little bit. And by then, with those signs, those secondary market sellers are going to pull back their supply. They will think, ah, oh, there is no need for me to sell now. Maybe I can wait a bit and sell at a higher price. And you will see the demand and supply on the secondary market you know, turning, diverging a little bit further. Yeah. And by then, people will go back to the primary market. And then prices will go up in the places we are looking at, the new property prices. Yeah, well, to your point, existing home prices actually fell more than new home prices yeah. in, in May, it fell 1%. So I'm wondering how far do you think we are from that point of uh, a virtual cycle starting to brew? I think that we are getting there. Probably in the next three to six months' time, uh, we okay. should probably see more stabilization and potentially improvement in existing home prices. We are starting to see more and more people getting, uh, um, you know, interested in in property purchases. Yep. This is not just in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. This is actually going into tier two, tier three as well. So we think that potentially can bring in more buyers, and they are now considering to do, you know, to uh, to pull out uh, their wallet and uh, probably write a check soon. But uh, that will probably take some time. They're still watching. So I think it's important to keep up with uh, policy easing at the moment mm -hmm. and uh, try not to drag for too long. Helen Chow will be rejoining us in a couple of minutes, Chief Grade of China Economist there at GOFA Global Research. Uh, very briefly across these markets, CSR 300, 3 tenths of 1%. Within this, consumer staples like Baotai 
continue to see a further leg lower this Monday. We're going the opposite way though and seeing we're catching some sort of a bid here across uh, your offshore markets with the Hang Seng and the Hang Seng China Enterprises Index also catching a bid. Bottom of your screens. Uh, developers not really seeing a good start to the week. Yeah, coming up, we're going to be joined by Brighter Beauty CEO Jessica Gleason. She's a former executive at Starbucks China and really helped really launch the coffee chain uh, on the mainland as well. We'll discuss what she's seeing in the retail sector there. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're looking at live pictures of China's National Statistics Bureau. That briefing just happening here after, broadly speaking, it was a miss across the board when it comes to some of the data that we got uh, in May. So industrial production, fixed asset investments, those are the ones that did miss. So coming out at 5.6 percent, 4 percent there when it comes to fixed assets. Retail sales that we talked about could be the standout and the loan standout in the mix of this data, 3.7 percent uh, upside there. So certainly, you know, there was this sort of seasonal surge, people traveling. There was about 618 going on as well. Yeah, we've got that shopping spree that ends soon. Yeah, Tuesday, <laughs> I think. So 24 hours to take advantage of 618. <laughs> Month-long shopping spree, of course. Now, the festival in invented by JD.com is a key test, of course, for e-commerce platforms. Our China correspondent, Min Min Lo, looks at how companies are convincing or trying to convince Chinese consumers to part with their money. Yeah. Rihanna making Shantong crepes. Yeah. Apple offering its biggest ever iPhone discount. And an AI powered avatar of JD.com founder, billionaire Richard Liu. All in hopes of standing out and getting consumers to spend. Similar to the Double Eleven shopping holiday invented by Alibaba, 618 is JD.com's version of a month long discount spree ending on June 18th. This battle for the consumer dollar has taken a hit in recent years as the slowing economy has turned Chinese consumers into more selective shoppers, making the price point for products even more of a focus. Consumers are still buying. They're buying cheaper things. The, the, the average ticket size is coming down. They are still going with some of the low price strategy out there. Smaller companies are now competing in the same space thanks to China's anti-monopoly investigation into Alibaba in 2020. Douyin, Kuaishou and Little Red Book have joined in the e-commerce game. Douyin leading the charge with 70% growth in GMV year-on-year. -year. Alibaba and JD.com trailing behind in single-digit growth. The smaller upstarts have forced Alibaba to rethink strategy. Founder Jack Ma calling on employees to think outside the box. The result, a partnership with ByteDance own Douyin, allowing merchants to advertise on the video platform and make transactions on Taobao. But even with the intense competition, consumer spending still cooled in recent months. And the platforms are hoping to reverse that during these key shopping holidays. Min Min Lo, Bloomberg News. And we're just getting some lines from that National Bureau of Statistics briefing here. And in terms of basically talking about this data, which came out pretty much uh, weaker than expected. So effective domestic demand is insufficient. Of course, we're seeing that when it comes to not just uh, this data here today, what we saw when it comes to the credit data, the inflation data, and those new home prices as well. So certainly that's one to watch. Uh, I want to bring back, of course, our roundtable. And uh, Helen Chow, she's still with us, Chief Greater China Economist at BOFA Global Research, also with us is Jessica Gleason, former Starbucks China executive and now the CEO of Brighter Beauty. She's a consultant to many retail brands as well uh, in and around China. Thank you so much. Jessica, I'll start with you. It seems like we are seeing this kind of broad consumption downgrade in China, whether it's cyclical or structural. Do you expect this trend to continue? Um, I think when you talk with people on the ground here and when you look at what's happening out in the retail shops, really you see a large number of people who are looking for a reason to believe in the a future recovery. They're not yet seeing enough, um, I think, things in the broader economy to start opening up the wallets maybe as quickly as we'd like them to. But you see, I think, this um, cautious optimism where they want to see um, more of the, you know, more job stability, more 
um, confidence that it's okay to spend part of the money that's been saved through the post-COVID period. And so um, I think when you look at things like this last holiday, we just came out of uh, Dragon Festival, you saw the city, I, I live in Shanghai, so the city was definitely out and about. People were spending money in retail, uh, people are spending money in food and beverage, um, but likely this week when they're back at work, uh, they'll be uh, eating inside uh, and not going out for lunch as much. Hmm. Yeah, but Helen, before I bring in, uh, Je Jessica, just one follow-up on that. What are you hearing sure. from your clients, the companies that you advise? What's the, where, is, where are they on this spectrum of hope? Yeah, I think that there's a sense that you need to earn consumer engagement right now. So in the past, I've been in China almost 20 years, you know, in the past, if you had something and you put it on the market, you were fairly confident you could find someone to sell it or to purchase it. But now with all of the competition, there's really a sense of how do you keep your consumers engaged between shopping cycles? How do you, you know, bridge that offline online environment? Um, I think you're seeing bricks and mortar really looking at how do I uh, create opportunities to bring consumers in and then how do I convert those consumer engagement moments into online sales after they've left the stores. So I think for Helen, the clients can, that yeah. I work with, oh, sorry. I was going to say for the no, clients go ahead, that I work with, yeah. uh, no worries, for the, for the clients that I'm working with, um, I think they um, uh, obviously, if you've been in China for a period, we had some great uh, retail activity in the past. Um, I think people are seeing the uptick coming out, particularly in some sectors out of COVID. And um, I think it's just a little more work than it was in the past. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think great retail will win in China. Uh, Helen, maybe you can chime in here on, you know, everyone thought when China was going to reopen that we would just, you know, they would just mirror what the U.S. did, this revenge spending consumption boom. It didn't quite play out that way. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I, you kind of remind me of the joke that uh, everyone is expecting us to revenge spending, revenge traveling, but we're so kind that we don't want to revenge anyone. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but I think that it's a key reason is probably people's concerns on their income and future income. Um, consumer confidence so far remains relatively weak um, as, com uh, as opposed to uh, about 125 of where it was, consumer confidence level, national level, uh, back before April 2022. Now we're standing at a barely 88. So this is saying that we still have a long way to cover before we actually go back to the, you know, really strong state or better shape of the consumers. Mm. We think that this is partly related to the fact that uh, the access savings um, that the consumers had in China as opposed to as opposed to those in the US are not from fiscal subsidy. These are their own money that has been saved because they postponed their decisions to buy by properties. So when they're spending their own money, they may not necessarily want to draw on this kind of fund that they saved by, you know, delaying their, their uh, home purchase plans. And secondly, we also see that the, the difference partly between China and the U.S. is while we may not see very strong confidence at the moment, we don't necessarily have to worry too much about the uh, uh, actually the wealth effect from the dropping property prices. In the U.S., if property prices drop by 25 percent, as in China's case, uh, in existing homes already, then we probably would see significant downside to retail. But so far, it's still holding in positive territory. So the reason, in our view, is uh, we think it's, it's because because that China actually has not been offering uh, financial products such as mortgage equity withdrawal to allow people to monetize the capital gain from property price appreciation. And therefore, when property prices come down, they do not have to come up with more cash to pay back their lending, uh, their borrowing. So that's probably why that so far is still holding up OK. But uh, without the government subsidy, they couldn't do much better. Yeah. And w what what of the problem is structural post pandemic? Do we have a better idea of what the structural phenomenon are? 
Well, I think it's structural and cyclical at the same time. Okay. Structural in the sense that I believe, especially in certain categories of, uh, uh, of uh, consumer products, I think the structural changes probably came at the back of a cohort effect, a very strong you know, millennium and also Gen Z kind of cohort effect because they choose to, to, to actually go for something else. For example, you know, in the past, it was usually the foreign brands that, is, that are for our generation, the, the representation of uh, quality and also you know uh, status. status and uh, you can show off a little bit and just live a little right mm. but uh, for the younger generation actually they are very much welcoming the Chinese names as well and the competition therefore has Tick, basically been tipped upside down in the sense that in the past, you know, foreign brands can pretty much just relax and uh, whatever you present on the counter, people are happily paying. But now the competition is much more fierce. And this is actually exacerbated with, by a cyclical problem, which is, you know, because of the property sector slowdown, a lot of the capital, a lot of this money that used to be invested in such high return in, uh, sectors yeah. are now having nowhere to go. So they think, okay, consumers or you know EVs or you know uh, the lithium battery. These are great sectors, so let's go for it. So the supply go up really quickly, not only in those access capacity in the industrial sectors, but also in beverage and food. Yeah. So when that happens, there is much more competition at the moment. So both cyclical and structural. Yeah, Jessica, maybe you can chime in. You mentioned. There's still opportunities for good retail. What is good retail now? Is it is it a domestic? Is it is it is it an international brand? Is is it in the premium segment? I mean, what in your eyes is is still doing good and well in the face of all these price cuts that we're seeing in the retail sector? Yeah, I think consumers are shopping for value these days, right? It's not about cheap everything. It's if I'm spending on the, the money on it, am I getting good value? And value, I think the definition of value is really changing in China as well. You know, I think um, we were mentioning earlier before people were looking for the biggest label or the biggest brand. And now I think people are looking for performance. I think one of the sectors that you're seeing a lot of movement in uh, from a retail standpoint is anything with health and wellness. So any brand, local or international, that is selling, you know, workout equipment or, you know, uh, outdoor equipment. I, I think more uh, camping gear has been sold in Shanghai post-pandemic than probably was the decade before, because people are really looking at how do I get out and, um, you know, camp in the city. If you look along the river in Shanghai on a sunny Sunday, you'll see um, as many camping tents and, and picnic tables as you would in a national park in the U.S. I think the city of Shanghai is spending a lot of money on developing parks um, to encourage people to get back outside. I think you're seeing uh, consumers traveling to natural destinations more than in the past they might have gone on shopping tours. People are really looking at how do I invest my time to get outside, to enjoy my family, uh, and to le live a happier lifestyle, a healthier lifestyle. Um, I think you, China's really focused on health and wellness these days. And so brands that are in that space, whether domestic or international, I think will do really well. Yeah, I mean, case in point, and you can chime in on this too, uh, Jessica, if you want. I mean, Luckin Coffee, right, has yeah. has surpassed your, yeah. your 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 previous your previous company, Shinbaku. Yeah. The is there a future now, or what does the future look like for luxury companies looking to sell to this younger generation? Is there still as bright a future there as say 25 years back, when you could just put any bag on the table and people would just outbid each other? Yeah, I think from my perspective, you're seeing that slow down because I think they're going to take that money and spend it on, you know, in the case that I was just talking about, they'll spend it on luxury, you know, shoes and hiking stuff. I think one of the things I was out, um, we just had the Dragon Boat Festival um, last week, and I was out looking at what was going on in the streets, and you could see that China had gotten really comfortable at being comfortable. So uh, very few high heeled shoes. People are wearing, you know, comfortable flats. Uh, I think one of the things that indicates that I think people are looking for um, outcome is a lot of the fashion has gotten a lot more whimsical 
than maybe it was a year or two. You're starting to see uh, in women's fashion some ruffles and some, you know, floral patterns and in young men's fashion sort of oversized puffy sneakers and oversized um, uh, jeans and things like that. And I think those are indications of people are really looking to enjoy life, not get too stressed out. Um, one other segment that I think is interesting to see coming up is scents and fragrances, and not just as this is my signature scent, uh, like you might have had with Chanel in the past, but now they're looking at this is a scent that is good for my mental health. And so uh, you're hearing <laughs> things around how do I lead a relaxing life? How do I make sure my kids aren't too stressed out? Um, and so I think things in those segments will be good retail uh, and uh, will continue to grow because they match sort of where the government is going as well. Yeah. Okay. You gave me a lot of ideas for what to give David for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Also, also the, yeah. <laughs> yeah Big clown what. shoes. I, Looks it's, like it. it's cyclical. Uh, it's cyclical. Someone was mentioning, <laughs> and you would have to have been in China for a while, that the bubble skirts are coming back. Um, but I think that there's a sense oh, of, you know, know, people spent a lot of time being very um, conservative with their money and, and they're not opening their mm. checkbook wide, but they're having sort of intentional impulse buys, right? So mm. they'll spend a little on a few days out of the year, yeah. but they're going to make sure it's fun when they do it. And I think experiential, okay. so, um, anything with concerts, sorry, concerts or entertainment. Okay, so the bubble went from property to skirts. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah, where the bubble much. is. All right. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now zenned into the week. Um, didn't need to do my 20 seconds of mindfulness there. Jessica Gleason, thank you so much. <laughs> Former Starbucks executive and also joining sure. us here on set is Helen Chow, Chief Greater China Economist, both a global research. Right. Uh, very, very quickly, we're just taking straight, of course, to, of course, the Premier Lee and his visit to Australia and, of course, the meeting there. They just signed, I believe, um, a few MOUs. MOUs. Yep. Uh, we'll get you those details in a bit. But what we're hearing from the Chinese premier as well as Albanese, the prime minister saying China has a vital role to play in the region. I'm determined to grow China ties where we can. Of course, the economic ties are still very much strong. Hmm. Security ties is where we're seeing a little bit of that friction. We'll see if we get a little more detail in that press briefing. Plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. We'll support Hong Kong's RCEP accession. China welcomes Australia as the guest country of honor for the China International Fair for Trading Services 2025. We both support strengthening people-to-people -people ties and cement popular support for our bilateral relations. The two sides will strengthen exchanges and cooperation in science and technology, culture, sports, education, academia, aviation, health, tourism, and at the subnational level. China will continue its cooperation with Australia on giant panda conservation and research and will provide a pair of younger giant pandas to other ladies too, so that they will continue to serve as a bridge of friendship between the two peoples. The two sides will hold the 10th meeting of the Joint Science and Technology Commission and the 8th high-level dialogue in due course in Australia. We agreed to provide each other with reciprocal access to five-year and multiple entry visas for tourism, business, and visiting family members. So as to better facilitate There you go. China's number two, Li Chang, there just speaking, uh, talking a little bit more about the future of China relations with Australia. They have signed a uh, memorandum of understanding, I believe, on strategic dialogue. So we talked about the sort of rapid warm, warming of ties between Australia and China. The Albanese government certainly has been the driving force of that since, of course, uh, the prime minister took office. And I think they're really trying to at least enhance uh, this FTA implementation that they're saying. And we're getting a bit more details on this MOU. Albanese is still talking about warmer tie stabilization. I'm determined to grow China ties where we can, where we can. That's a, that's an interesting part. Yeah, that statement. because there, there are, that's an acknowledgement of still the points of friction and yes. the structural differences, of course, between which I guess is a very good starting point that we should be expecting a lot more progress on some of these things that they just talked about. Uh, here's what's so encouraging, I guess, between the two sides here.
Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you talk about Australia trade to China, I believe it's back to record levels. Mm. Um, obviously, they talked about the lifting of tariffs of wine. That certainly has been some warming of relations there. We talked about pandas. Yeah. But there's still quite a lot of those tensions, right? You talk about you know, how the Australians are getting much closer to the U.S. Uh, when it comes to security ties. That's certainly one sticking point. We'll see if they get to that sort of discussion. I, I believe that they, they, the Australians were thinking about you know, talking about these frictions as well. Uh, also, when it came to just access to critical minerals, right, and, and how China really is trying to gain access to this in Australia. And it seems like there's been some pushback on that front, of course. And that's still part of the very much the policy priorities of the Chinese government as well. So there's still things to work out there. We'll get you the latest once we hear a little bit more. But there you guys see the shaking of hands between the two leaders there. China and Australia. Checking some of these Japanese markets as we head into this lunch break here right now. The topics is falling uh, quite a bit here, and we talk about the Nikkei. Uh, we're off the lows, but we're still talking about near 2% losses here for the Nikkei 225. It's overall just globally, risk sentiment has soured here. Is, you know, the French story, that certainly is one thing where you know there is a spillover effect in some ways. Dollar yen still around 157.49, uh, despite what we heard from that BOJ meeting. Yes, they announced a little bit of what this QT could look like, but the lack of detail is where really the, some of these yen traders were quite disappointed by. Yeah, and this is playing out across the region, too, as Yvonne is pointing out. Uh, just about across the board, maybe not to the extent we're seeing over in, uh, in Japan. So Japan's down 2%. If you remove Japan and maybe you take out China as well, we're about half of 1% on the regional benchmark. Asia x Japan should be, uh, in fact, falling much more than the actual benchmark uh, itself. In terms of sector groups, there's really a pain point coming through. It's not as obvious when you look at it on a region wide basis, but particularly with China and property names, they are really feeling the pinch following the numbers there. In fact, the National Bureau of Statistics uh, just came out and mentioned that the, they will need to see, we will need to see, uh, need to wait more and need to wait more time uh, before the property measures start to take effect. And you look at what happened back uh, in May, the data came out about an hour back, right? The biggest drop in new home prices in 10 years and the most cities seeing month-on-month -month price declines in new home prices going back nine years. So the data has yet to turn. Let's bring in Mark Cranfield out of our MLA team. He joins us right now. Mark, so uh, there's, the, there's obviously the data that came through out of China, which I would say in hindsight, because even before the data came out, there was already this tone of risk aversion in the region early this Monday. Who, who, do, we, who do we blame for this? <laughs> Uh, well, certainly the uh, the French have a lot to do with it. The uh, the election there is causing huge disruption, as you were as you were saying earlier, uh, and it's going to be a very difficult week because we are we're getting into the stage now where there are fewer distractions for for European traders. They'll be very focused on the election, not just in France but in the UK as well. So, election risk is extremely high in terms of what it could do to financial markets. It was already a very very bad week for French equities and bonds last week. And now, as, as time is running out towards the, the votes which come at the end of the month, um, opinion polls um, still seem to favor some of the opposition. But more importantly, if you listen to what some of the, the leaders in the, the far right are saying, they, they seem to actually be reaching out to, to French voters. And the market won't like it. They, they won't like them going over their heads. So the, the likely scenario is that, that traders will want to price in the worst case scenario in advance of the vote. It may end up not being as bad as expected, or we may see a bit of a rebound once the elections are out the way. But ahead of it, people are going to take a very defensive posture. So we can expect more trouble for French bonds, French equities, that'll spill over to the euro, the rest of the European markets as well. And that overall gloom isn't going to help the rest of the world too much. The US markets would need to do very, very well to really get over the impact of Europe. Uh, when well, you talk about China too, I mean, it, it seems like there was a there was enough evidence for for disappointment. Whether it's that MLF that they kept on hold, mm. data which was pretty much weak, beyond maybe barring retail sales, which was the only standout here. I mean, is it just going to lead? you know, to more consolidation in this equity rally that mm. really has hit the skids the last few weeks in China? It seems it was already uh, running out of momentum anyway, even before the data came out today. And it, you can only put off interest rate cuts for so long. I mean, clearly, investors in the Chinese markets have been looking for, for a policy easing for some time. There's been hints that it was coming. 
it, it's been delayed again. They, they didn't even inject as much money as was expected in the MLF today either. So from the central bank's point of view, and obviously they're worried about the currency. If they, if they go too hard on easing, it could weaken the currency even further. It's already in a, not a very good position as it is. So China is in a tough spot here. They, they may want to to do more to, to help the market, particularly when you look at the property numbers, which came out today. Again, another bad set of national numbers on the property front. So clearly, the, the big obstacles, which have been there for a long time, they're not really going away. The property measures look good on the surface, but the um, action to, to put it right seems to be taking a very long time. And people will lose patience unless you feed investors with something quickly they're going to take their money elsewhere. And there's plenty of opportunities around the world. So we could easily get back into a scenario, which we've seen several times over the past couple of years, where foreign investors just walk away from the Chinese market. They leave it to the locals and they, they shift their money elsewhere. And that is not a positive for the market. Yeah. And if, if Mark, if they do walk away this time, the bar for them to re-enter given how things, how good things looked a few, a few, few weeks ago, up until recently, uh, would be much higher then. Is, is the bar now for Chinese policymakers to come up with something bigger? Is the bar for the third plenum now higher, for example? It is, it's very high. And, and some of it is outside their control because, of course, one of the things that would really help the Chinese market would be if their currency was on an appreciating trend. Well, that's going to be very difficult when you have such a strong U.S. dollar. And it doesn't look as though the U.S. dollar is going to weaken anytime soon. The, the Federal Reserve is delaying its own interest rate cuts for a long time, maybe not even this year at all. December is probably the earliest if they're going to do it. So if anything, the U.S. dollar is going to outperform. It's going to continue to stay very strong. That's not very good for emerging market currencies, including the Chinese yuan. So that means that when investors look at China, they have to assume they're not going to get any joy from the currency. It's not going to help them. So that, can they make their investment choices based on the fact that there's no additional gain from investing in that point of view? It's purely down to what they think of Chinese com companies and what the government is doing to support the onshore demand. And that's a bit inconclusive. So certainly, there are lots of reasons for people to, to look elsewhere and to be more committed to the US, maybe even to, to think that once these European elections are out of the way, maybe there'll be opportunities there. But certainly China is making it very difficult for foreign money to take it seriously. Mark, thank you. Mark Cranfield there joining us out of our M Live team in, in Singapore. Uh, we're going to head back to these live pictures, this uh, press briefing from the National Bureau of Statistics. And they're talking about, obviously, uh, the China domestic demand. Uh, they do expect that to continue to recover. They just need more time, they said, to see the effects of these property measures, probably addressing, of course, the weaker data that we got out of uh, May here when it comes to new and old home prices. What else are you seeing, Dave? Yes, um, the producer prices, they're expecting that to decline, expected, uh, the, the decline in producer prices, let me rephrase that, apologies, is expected to continue to narrow, so the pr approach to zero sh should continue. Uh, although I think the key point here was almost said at the very top and beginning of the press briefing where effective domestic demand still remains uh, insufficient. And to borrow a phrase from Helen Chow, our guest early on from both her securities, to close that output gap where you are still seeing a tremendous downside pressure on price press, including, of course, what we're seeing in the home, in the home market. So, yeah, um, looks like we will be getting you back to this in a moment once we have, of course, more substantial lines coming through from the ongoing press briefing on your screens, NBS spokeswoman Liu Aihua speaking there, of course, in Beijing 40 minutes after the release of the monthly activity numbers there. Yeah, and she did talk about what, what led to that beat in retail sales growth, right? Labor Day holidays, you had the early discounts on June 18, you had the equipment upgrade programs that did contribute to that yeah. number. Whether that's sustainable is certainly another question. Uh, but Live Go, that's where all you're going to get all that content and analysis from our team of expert editors. They're, they're not just talking about this press briefing, but also this Albanese and uh, a press briefing with Lee Chang as well that's happening in Canberra that just wrapped up here. But they did talk about those MOUs expanding in, in energy, new energy cooperation, even talking about including Australia in a visa waiver program that was going to Premier Lee there. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to the China Show. Here are some of the major stories we're following from around the world. The Israeli military is starting a daily 11-hour tactical pause along a route to southern Gaza to increase humanitarian aid. The army says the pause is in effect until further notice and is being coordinated with UN and international aid agencies. The pause comes weeks after the World Court ordered Israel to immediately halt its military assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah. The Ukrainian president's bid for Global South support has faltered at a two-day summit in Switzerland. Vladimir Zelensky was trying to broaden backing for Kyiv as it battles Russia's invasion. India, Indonesia and Saudi Arabia were among the nations that did not sign on to that final statement drawn up at the meeting. China also avoided the event, while Brazil only sent an observer. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute says the number of nuclear warheads deployed with missiles and aircraft is set to increase over the next few years. A new report estimates that number rose to nearly 4,000 this year. Most of the arsenal belongs to either Russia or the U.S., but the institute believes China has also placed some warheads on high operation alert. Now, South Korea says sharing any of well, any nuclear technology is its red line for cooperation between the North and, and Russia. Now, President Vladimir Putin is set to make his first trip to North Korea in 24 years. That comes likely this week. Uh, South Korea's defense minister, Shin Won-sik, spoke exclusively to Bloomberg in Seoul about what he thinks Putin will get from Pyongyang. Putin wants what Putin wants would be artillery shells and missiles. Putin is expected to seek closer security cooperation with North Korea, especially military supplies such as artillery shells that are necessary to seize a chance to win. In terms of the satellite, uh, we saw North Korea's last satellite launch fail, and that's the spice Russia's pledge for cooperation, space cooperation. So what's your take on that? They are exactly Russia's latest engine technologies. So our assessment is that North Korea has admitted to receiving engine technologies from Russia. In terms of why they failed, they have yet to secure reliability as they integrate North Korean engines and other technologies that they have developed with Russian technologies. North Korea is believed to be continuing engine tests at the moment, and we believe that they will try another launch in the second half. How much North Korea is spending on launching these missiles from short range to intermediate range and ICBM? Do you have a breakdown? Rather than speaking of the cost of individual missiles, let me give you an overall figure. North Korea fired around 30 missiles last year. According to a thorough estimate from the Korean Institute for Defense Analysis, known as KEDA, we would need some $1 billion in spending. The money is enough to cover North Korea's food shortages for a year. So in fact, North Korea is ignoring its people's hardships to carry out missile provocations. So Minister, Russia helping North Korea's military technology, that inevitably means greater threat for South Korea. So what is your red line in terms of Moscow's military cooperation with North Korea? We consider the transfer of key technologies related to nuclear and missile programs as the red line, but it's something that needs to be decided together by South Korea and the U.S. There's no point in the South Korean government setting it alone. So we are having discussions to decide with the U.S. and share with like-minded countries. We're hearing that um there could be another three-way summit between South Korea, U.S., and Japan. So in terms of the security cooperation, what is the priority for South Korea? A priority would be to establish a system to more effectively, promptly, and coherently respond to North Korea's nuclear and missile threats among South Korea, the U.S., and Japan, and to make that irreversible. So during the last Shangri-La dialogue, we have decided to create a security cooperation framework amongst the three of us. South Korea has drafted a document and proposed to the U.S. and Japan. The defense ministers of the three countries will sign it in the second half of this year.
한미일 국방장에 서명하기로 했습니다. Minister, China has accused the U.S. of trying to build what it calls an Asian version of NATO. So what are your thoughts on that? On China's concerns, I think it really depends on China's behavior. If all the countries in the Indo-Pacific, not just China, adhere to the rules-based world order, the rest of the world will not try to limit it. So the idea of an Asian version of NATO to me seems like a premature concern. But at the same time, I believe that the best way to dispel such concern is for China to give the Indo-Pacific region and the international community confidence that it will uphold the rules-based international order, and there should be no problem. That was the South Korean Defense Minister Shin Won Sik there speaking with Bloomberg Su Hyung Choi. Well, coming up, tensions between Beijing and the Philippines intensify as vessels collide in the South China Sea. We'll have the details on that and the anti China protests in Manila. This is Bloomberg. Probably in the next three to six months' time, uh, we okay. should probably see more stabilization and potentially improvement in existing home prices. We are starting to see more and more people getting, uh, um, you know, interested in in property purchases. Yep. This is not just in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. This is actually going into tier two, tier three as well. So we think that potentially can bring in more buyers, and they are now considering to do, you know, to uh, to pull out uh, their wallet and uh, probably write a check. Soon. That was B of A's Helen Chow on China's property sector after new data showed a slump in those new home prices actually now accelerating as well. We talked about property easing, those measures in focus in Chinese state media today. Here is your China brief. Well, when it comes to Shanghai securities, they're saying that most cities except Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen have dropped the floor for mortgage rates after the PBOC's policy changed last month. It also says medium to long term loans for residents still need to be boosted further. And the PBOC backed financial news says interest rates have room to fall further, but that any move faces internal and external constraints. The front page story was published ahead of today's MLF rate decision. Now it says the central bank will have to take into account lenders net interest margins and the yen exchange rate before cutting. Meanwhile, the Global Times has published this editorial blasting the U.S. following a report that the Pentagon launched a secret campaign against Chinese COVID vaccines in the Philippines. A Reuters investigation found the U.S. military launched this covert program using social media to discredit Sinovac jabs during the pandemic. Now, it says the effort was payback for China's efforts to blame the U.S. for COVID spread. The Global Times says the alleged move shows that the U.S. never truly wants the Philippines to develop, with Manila only a geopolitical pawn and a consumable for Washington. It also published Sinovac's response, warning of serious consequences from stigmatizing, of course, vaccines. Yeah, and, and those tensions between China and the Philippines is, is a hot topic now, Dave. Mm. Um, not just on the back of this story from Reuters, uh, but really what we're seeing across you know, the South China Sea and the like. Weibo users are reacting to a China Coast Guard statement saying that Chinese and Philippine vessels collided near the Spratly Islands today in the South China Sea, and it blames the Philippine vessel for ignoring warnings. Unsurprisingly, the reactions are mostly nationalistic. Some say this is great. We need to crack down hard on behavior like the Philippines so those behind it won't think about sneaking around again. Others have said we've got laws for a reason. If you break them, they will be consequences. Being too lenient only makes those troublemakers more arrogant. Last one here, clearly another tactical provocation by the U.S. sending out their advanced scouts to test your limits. If you don't hit back, they'll just keep pushing. Yeah. This, to Yvonne's point, is a statement from the Chinese Coast Guard uh, talking about how the vessel deliberately and dangerously approached a Chinese ship in an unprofessional manner, although no mention was made on whether there were injuries or any damage to either vessel so far. So we're forgetting, of course, the Chinese side. Let's wait to hear. We, we have to hear, of course, from the Philippines, which, by the way, is on a public holiday uh, today as well. Uh, all that being said, developing story this. Uh, back to markets very quickly. So we're looking at chips. We're looking at property on the back of the property story and also the chip story. Here's property for one. Uh, biggest drop in 
pri pri new home prices in 10 years across 70 cities on new home prices. And we're looking at the Hang Seng Index as we approach 19 minute, the 90 minute mark into the session here. And it's worth noting, while you look at price moving up and we've shaken off at least the early cobwebs, the, the rest of the region, a lot of markets are shut across the region today. So there's not a lot of liquidity out there. Certainly goes to sim, same goes to show as far as the volume goes. That's it from us here, the Monday edition of the China Show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is just ahead. This is Bloomberg.